Thanks everyone for coming in and, uh, and watching the Q&A and for helping us raise funds for, for Sam Cox. So uh, we have with us uh, John Strykermeyer. He's the, the, the tall guy with the white hair that you can see there. Um, John entered the army in 66, graduated Special Forces December 67, arrived at MACV SOG uh, FOB1 in May 68, ran missions as a 1-0 team leader for RT Idaho. His team was transferred to FOB4 in January 69, and he served there until late April. Um, he returned to CTN later in, for another tour in October 69, and left in April 70. Mm -hmm. He has three books out about MACV SOG um, and over 30 podcasts made with support from Navy SEAL Commander Joffo Willink. How's that for the biog uh, uh, tilt? Perfect. Better than anything I could have done. <laughs> cool. Okay. And you can all hear me all right. Yeah, I should have checked that. So, bye bye. Um, all right, cool. And we've got Dick Thompson with us. Um, uh, and Dick is the, the guy with the SOG patch you can just see on his, on his shirt there. And uh, Dick joined the army in 67 and, <laughs> and in uh, September 68, he was selected to be a team leader at 1-0 with uh, MACV SOG in Vietnam, where he ran 20 recon missions with RT Virginia. Were you with Alabama as well, Dick? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Michigan. <laughs> and Michigan, yeah. yeah, that's it. I knew there was a couple of teams as well. Thank you. Um, up until January 70, uh, Dick retired in January 88 after 21 years service as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he's an internationally recognized leader, consultant, scientist, educator, and speaker about the high performance zone. And he helps, uh, with, he helps veterans with his arsenal stress resilience uh, tool. And if any veterans are in the audience, be sure to make contact with us uh, and engage with that because it's completely free and, and a really great tool. Um, Dick has just written his fourth book, this for the first time in detail about his memoirs of Mac V. Sock. And it's not, it's not out yet, but we'll come to that. So um, we're raising funds tonight for Sam Cox, the Royal Marine, who's heading to Antarctica in November, where he will walk alone for 75 days uh, to break the world record for the longest solo unassisted crossing of Antarctica. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone in the audience, please watch the podcast if you haven't already, uh, where Dick and Tilt uh, discuss the expedition with Sam. It has a lot of useful life lessons in it for all of us that we can all take away and you'll truly appreciate his courage in, in setting out on this expedition. So, guys, what do you think of uh, Sam's planned ex expedition? Uh, tilt first. Um, better him than me. That sounds like a real adventure. I don't know if I'd be up for 75 days in Antarctica, whether there's a lot of sunshine or not. <laughs> I'm very impressed and uh, honored to support Sam and his effort. Okay, thank you. And and Dick, what do you think of him? Yeah, uh, very impressed. Uh, that's a long way, and it's really cold <laughs> and windy weather. So, uh, yeah, it, I mean, just watching the preparation, watching what he's done, um, how now he's down to uh, counting grams in terms of weight um, that he's got to carry with him, how he's going to deal with that, all of the details of, of the nutrition and everything. So uh, it's, you know, it's fascinating to watch it. But it also reminds you of, a, you know, a military operation where you have to plan, you have to get all the right equipment. Um, but in the end, you have to go out and execute. And I'm sure he's going to do that well. So um, can't wait to congratulate him when he gets back. Me too. <laughs> wow. I think there's going to be um, some sort of gala dinner where he auctions off all his kit when he gets back. So he wanted to invite you guys over for that. So maybe we can all uh, we can all go to that together or something. That'd be fun. Yeah, sounds good. So, so um, right, let's dive in. So I wanted to thank everyone in the audience for um, your excellent questions you've all been sending in over the last few days. Uh, we've we've sort of organize them all into a into a bit of a list here and uh, and thanks again also to everyone for assisting with sam's fundraiser so um let's jump in with uh, the first question from jummy uh which which is what, what what might be the most vivid remembered detail of your time in vietnam in any of your senses 
Um, I guess we'll, we'll go with tilt first each time on this, just to keep it simple for you guys. <laughs> the most vivid memory from Vietnam? Yeah. Hmm. Apalm. And then it would call oh. in on the enemy and uh, like a very first time I used it, the A1 Sky Raider pilot that delivered it said, now y'all put your heads down, it's crispy critter time. And there's something about napalm that's just horrific. I'm glad that we use it against the enemy and not vice versa. Right. Okay. And, and Dick? Yeah, I think... <clears throat> You know, the napalm is very vivid, uh, <laughs> but I since since Till took that one, my my second one I think is claymores. Um, being able to set off uh, a series of claymores simultaneously uh, in the dark to break up an assault, um, just the overwhelming power of all of those steel balls coming at you out of nowhere, traveling four thousand feet a second and just ripping uh, the bad guys apart. Um, I, I always kind of got a kick out of that. <laughs> then you had the Claymores with the five second fuses as you were E and E. Yeah. Yeah, which, which must be kind of, you know, if one person makes even the slightest mistake with that fuse, it's curtains. A back blast is very nasty on a claymore. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you definitely gotta get away from it. <laughs> so that's a high risk occupation right there. So, okay, Indeed. thank you. Um, we've got Melon Mafia asking, did you guys like the local food and did you eat it regularly? Um, we went to Fulong, which was right outside of Fubai, whenever, particularly in the early days when we reformed uh, ST Idaho. We go down to the village, and it was always like a mystery meal, but you had to eat it, you know. And one of the meals in particular, I'll never forget. We ate like one of my first meals. We ate it. There's a couple of odd things that were in this soup and noodles. We ate it, but later I asked Hep, my interpreter, what it was, and it was a cow's eye. And uh, so, and the nook mom there was different than the nook mom today. <laughs> the nook mom back there, you had a the hardest thing about getting that's a flavoring for Vietnamese food. But there the hardest thing was just getting it past your nose. If you get it past your nose, it tastes good. But today's nook mom is much more flavorful. I love it. Yeah, I went to uh to a Chinese wedding uh as as one of the guests of honor and we had the soup bowl and you know I and up at the head table and I'm watching the the other guests eat chicken legs and chicken breasts and things <laughs> like that. And, you know, I, I dug into my, uh, my soup bowl and I had a, a chicken head, just, <laughs> just a whole head. Um, but there's not a lot of meat on it. There's a little skin, but there's not much meat. You do have a, a couple of eyeballs. Um, and, and I, I had a couple of feet. And when I asked my friend that I was with, what, you know, what's the deal? And he said, well, the, these are the most honored parts of the chicken. So the, the honored guests get those, you know, the other guests get, you know, the, the legs and things like that. So, you know, smile, eat it, enjoy it. Um, and kind of going back to the other question about the, the vivid sense and tying it with the food. Um, I just never got so I enjoyed eating monkeys. Um, <laughs> the, the, meat, the meat, it was kind of stringy. Um, it had a strange, t it didn't taste like chicken. You know, a lot of people say, well, it tastes like chicken. Nope. It, it tasted like something else. Um, and I was an Im imagining if, well, they won't say what I was imagining that it was based on <laughs> the texture and what it smelled like, but... <laughs> Uh, I just, you know, it, it was an experience several times. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I was feeling hungry before we started. So, um, so were there any missions you went on uh, that were su went surprisingly smoothly despite the odds? 
Um, we had a couple, and um, one one mission in Cambodia, we were in a perfect insert, and we were uh, going to get a POW off of Highway 33 in Cambodia. And um, right in the middle of it, then General Creighton Abrams called us back to base because two days earlier on Thanksgiving the 68, we had used a uh, white phosphorus grenade. And, there were, and Creighton Abrams had opened a formal investigation into us using a white phosphorus grenade. And uh, he wasn't, the uh, Cambodians weren't concerned about the 100,000 NBA that were in, quote, neutral Cambodia, but that white phosphorus pissed off people. The other one, we, um, we had one where we were in for four days, and we went in with two teams. The other team that was the one zero was Bill Wall, and his team ambushed a Pathet Lao ambush set up to ambush his recon team. And the worst thing about us, we had mosquitoes that this at night. They they worked on my face so bad in the morning I couldn't open my eyes. But that was a quiet mission. We were on the ground for four days. And we thought it was a training mission. Fifty years later, Spider Park said, Oh no, that was a regular mission. We were out there. We just fooled you. <laughs> yeah, I I used to try to get Tilt to go along with me if I was going into an area that had a lot of leeches. Okay. <laughs> If he went into a leech-infested area, they would just mob him. So um, <laughs> never, we never arranged to, to go together so he could take care of the leeches. But, uh, yeah, a lot of those. But, um, you know, it did go into to one where it was a eldest son mission where we were carrying some um, bad ammunition uh, to leave out there. Um, we ran into uh, some security forces uh, right after we got on the ground, uh, and it was it was pleasant in that it was nice to go against a force like those guys um, who ran, and you know we just kind of chased them down like rabbits. Um, <laughs> it was just it was so different than going against the NVA. Uh, you know, NVA were. They were bad dudes, uh, but these guys just kind of ran from us. So uh, we didn't abort the mission. We stayed in. We we uh, left our um, you know surprises behind for the NVA uh, to find a little bit later on. But uh, and and did a a night extraction. So it was um, it was a pretty cool mission and wasn't you know the bad ones like some of them were okay thank you and, and thank you mark on for the question um next question is from melon mafia um did you experience anything paranormal or spooky in the jungle i'm gonna pass to dick because he did <laughs> <laughs> my answer is no but to dick yes yeah i i did have we had a mission where we Bruce Lombard and I had put two teams together, um, <clears throat> and we had um, a whole bunch of NVA come down to visit us about nine o'clock. And um, this is when we we're a uh, North Vietnamese woman uh, came on the radio and um, read off all of our names as being killed in action that day. And, and she actually <clears throat> used my dick as my name rather than henry which everyone knew me by so that was a little spooky but i think what till's probably referring to is you know we were in contact all night and then the, and the next day and there were a couple of times where um i did see um you know the uh, a figure in a black robe and hood um pointing a, a bony finger at me and mouthing you know I'm going to get you. Um, at least that was my interpretation of what he was saying. Um, but, but I did encounter him a couple of times, and uh, I, he didn't get me that day. So that was good. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I hadn't really seen anything like that before. Maybe I didn't see it that day, but I sure thought I did. <laughs> it was a, it was a tough, tough 24 hours. 
Don't forget, on that radio transmission, he had a secure radio. And the NVA woman came on with his name, his nickname, that nobody, only he and his cousin and uh, Eldon Bargewell, they were the only people that knew, he knew him as Henry. Everybody else knew him as Dick. The NVA called him Dick that day. On a secure radio frequency. Yeah. It's made it all the more mind-boggling. Yeah, so this is a KY-38, you know, the most secure radio the Army had at the time. Um, you had a code gun. You had to load the code in every day. You had certain frequencies you had to use at certain times. Uh, you could talk in the clear. And somehow she had one of those radios, uh, had our frequencies, had our codes for the day, and was able to talk to me and not only read off our um, obituary, but just to put another little touch to it uh, for my benefit, she played funeral music in the background uh, like they played back at that time in in the southern United States. They had a particular kind of music they would play when they would read off their obituaries every day. Um, so she imitated that, which, um, you know, made it a, a little spooky. Yeah, that's unreal. That's, that's psychological operations on a, on a whole level. It's on the same level <laughs> you guys were doing, really. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. So uh, next question is from Des, who um, uh, I know Tilt's met uh, when we were at... Um, at Saw. So he was asking, this one's for Dick, uh, were you aware of the psychological aspect of warfare before your deployment, or did this become your interest uh, during or afterwards? My my interest in the beginning, before I went in the Army, was um, primarily uh, chemistry. Uh, I was into chemistry and science pretty heavy, um, but once I got in the Army and, and began to um, see some of the things we could do. I saw people, um, I mean, I, I, Tilt and I haven't talked about this. He might have seen this too, but we had people who would not shoot at the silhouettes on the firing range. So one of the things after the Korean War uh, that was done to try to uh, cause soldiers to engage the enemy more was to go to a silhouette target. So it was like they were shooting at a person uh, rather than a big bullseye type target. And there were people who refused to fire at a silhouette. And, and in fact, I have a, a, a friend of mine now who uh, was in the Marines a, a few years ago, uh, just went in for normal enlistment. And he said they had people on the firing range, Marine recruits, that wouldn't shoot at a silhouette target. So anyway, but watching that and then uh, in in the book that's coming out here in a few weeks, uh, you can see how psychology, from my perspective, started to spread across what I was seeing. You know, how, was the, how did the NVA react to things? How did the... Uh, our people react, what was the impact when you got back, you know, the impact of stress, things like that. And it grew and grew to the point that, you know, once I you know, got back to the States and went to finish uh, school, you know, I actually changed from chemistry to psychology. Great. Thank you, um, Dick. Um, I meant to ask you both at the beginning as the icebreaker question, and I completely forgot. Um, Till, how, how's it going with the Sogcast at the moment? Um, they're going quite well. Um, the first one that came out over a year ago, the George Sternberg, has over 200, 210,000 views. <laughs> and they've posted, uh, they come out first as audio podcasts on Spotify and Apple. We've had a total of 34 that have been posted. We've got 45 in the can. And then uh, Jocko and his staff post them when they're, after they edit them. And they've also, we're behind on posting the YouTube version, but they've done the first 18 that have been posted on YouTube. So if you 
go to YouTube and punch in Sawcast. They have uh, George Sternberg was number one. Uh, Jim Shorten Jones, a.k.a. the Wild Carrot, was number two. And Nick Brockhausen was three. So those are there. And, uh, and that's all funded by Jocko Willink. He's been supporting us big time on those stories. And uh, uh, between us girls, he's done more to get SOG stories out in the public than anybody in the Army. And we're very grateful for his support on that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and, and I know most of the guys in our um, folks in our audience are uh, a big fan. So um, what number are you on now? Did you say it was 30? We the, oh, we got 45 in the can. 40, 45. And they just posted number 34, which was Dale Hansen. It was part two with Dale Hansen. Yeah. Who ran, had three tours of duty and uh, he had major missions. And he even had a morning interview. He talked about a top secret program. They had a contoum called Ford something or another, where there had limited people that flew up in O-1s. There'd be two airplanes. One would fly low to the treetop taking pictures, and the other would be an aircraft for the Air Force and looking down to see where the enemy was shooting at them. <laughs> and then they would come back and direct attack air on the enemy. And then, of course, they took pictures and took it back. Yeah, Fort Drum. Somebody just reminded me. Thank you. And... Uh, that was an amazing story. So Dale Hansen, his book is Born Twice. And we quote the book. It's very well written. And uh, that was the, that's the latest where we are on that. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Dick, I wanted to just ask you uh, the icebreaker one that I forgot again, which was um, <laughs> when's your book coming out? <laughs> Hopefully... Uh... The first book one goes to uh, the publisher, hopefully next week. Um, they'll do they'll do a proof of it, print an actual book uh, that I can look through one more time just to make sure I don't see a typo or anything like that. And then it'll go back to them uh, with the approval to go ahead and start printing. So uh, this coming month, uh, it should... The first one should be available, and book two will, will be a couple of months behind that. What's your title, Dick? Somebody suggested it. Maybe it was uh, <laughs> SOG, uh, code name Dynamite. So they're born. <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty good. It's it's a some Mac V SOG one zero personal journal. So. Uh, this is this is what I saw, what I experienced, um, how I grew, learned as I went along, which I think is very similar to, you know, Tilt and other one zeros out there. Uh, we all experienced a lot of similar type things. So, well, I, as as a footnote here for our audience, I've had the pleasure of getting a look at the draft of this book. And, and 50 years from now, when Dick and I are long gone, we're pushing up daisies in the cemetery, people are going to turn to Dick's book as one of the first books that will have to be read on Mac V. Sog. It's that well written. And, Thank you. And, and I'm, really, I, I'm really happy to say that, uh, you know, to tell everyone in the audience that we, you know, as much as, as, much as it's in the future, you know, we, we've talked to Dick and Tilt about, bringing their books content into our next title, into our next game. So these guys are going to help us make the game that, that brings their books to life uh, for you guys to experience in a, in a gaming world. So uh, we are very, very excited about that. And uh, Yeah, and also for the audience, uh, Rob, if you don't mind, anybody who hasn't mm -hmm. heard Dick, the interview by Jocko Willink, Jocko Podcast 204, 05, and 06 are astounding. And just outstanding. The usual Jocko did his homework, and Dick's stories are mind-boggling. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, right, we'll go on to our next question. Thank you for that. And um, this is from Anti Flagellum. Uh, I think I can pronounce that right. So, um, <laughs> everyone picks these wild names for gaming. So, um, did, did you guys have any run-ins with interest, any interesting wildlife on a mission? Wildlife. <laughs> 
Uh, we had taggers that sur- that walked around our perimeter on at least three different missions. And on one we left in the morning after we left the RON, footprints were huge. I was astounded by in, by the size of the footprints of the tigers. Um, it, we never we never had contact direct, but there were stories of uh, tigers pulling men from the 103rd, 173rd Airborne, and a Marine who were pulled out from their night security positions and killed by a tiger. Of course, we had snakes, but again, we had our point man would always put out point to us poison the snakes there in the trees like we had the, uh, the two step snakes and you, they bite you, you took two steps and you were dead but Dix probably has better stories than mine <laughs> again uh, yeah we we had a tiger one night eat eat a dog and um, the dog's handler slash tracker so we got both <laughs> of them and <laughs> And we had, uh, we were attacked by rock apes one night, a whole gang of them. We killed like 40 of them, or we had had the Spectre gunship come in and kill like 40 of them. Um, we thought we were being attacked by NVA. There were so many of them and the way they were coming and, and then screaming and hollering when the, you know, Spectre opened up on them. And then, you know, you, you had like, Tilt was saying there there were over 40 different venomous species of snakes in the areas that we went into. So it was good to have um, the little guys there who could, who knew where to look for them, knew which one, you know, you didn't want to mess with. Because even if it wasn't a two-step, it was venomous. You were so far away from an emergency room, uh, you you were just not going to make it. You just you couldn't get evacuated in time, so yeah, had to watch for them. <clears throat> awesome, thank you. Um, next question is from Eon. Uh, did you ever encounter Khmer Rouge or Prophet Lao units across the fence? Uh, we didn't, but um, like I said earlier, in that one mission, we had two teams in. We were east of the Ashaw Valley, and the other team ambushed the Prophet Lao ambush and the pathet lao were we called them the pathetic lao because they just they were poorly trained and whenever um our teams encountered them it was basically uh, dealing with poorly trained against well-trained recon teams different quality of training than what uh, the nva had as dick said earlier yeah, I, I didn't have much contact <clears throat> with them uh, that I knew of. We might have hit some at night and we just didn't realize that's who it was. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Dick, Dick, on a different note um, that people I think would be really fascinated with, you did actually observe an NVA training camp where they were teaching counter recon tactics. Is that right? Yeah, so we were. <clears throat> We were looking for uh, a battalion that had finally become lost, NVA battalion. And when we found it, what was going on was it was on top of a mountain, triple canopy jungle. And they had cleared out areas under the canopy uh, and made like training classrooms out of them. So they had several of them around the mountain and other NVA were coming and going up the ridge lines up to the mountain and receiving training. So we were able to crawl up next to um, some of the training sites <clears throat> and listen to them uh, as they talked to classes. And they were teaching classes on um, what to do when you make con. And these were the anti-SOG uh, NVA that we were, that were being trained. So what do you do when you make contact with a SOG team, and they were teaching them that uh, if they open up with a large, heavy volume of fire, SOG teams would run, and they were talking about where we would try to go, how to cut us off. Um, so it was really interesting to listen to them talk about the tactics for that. Uh, another class, they were talking about <clears throat> um, what 
you know, Tilt and I <clears throat> would refer to later on as hugging, just getting as close to a, a SOG team as you could so that we couldn't bring in the close air support or particularly napalm. So they'd try to hug and get up close to us, uh, how to use dogs to track us and and things like that. So, and we brought all that information back and uh, turned it in, you know, in, in the Intel briefing so, so it could be uh, disseminated. Thank you. They, um, they called it getting close to the belt. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we've got a question from Decker that follows on from that, which is what was the most significant single source of intel you collected over the fence, if, if you know you know what you brought back, if you got a chance to find out about it? Well, um, <clears throat> a few times we did wiretaps where we couldn't hear anything during the wiretap. But the CIA told us to always record whenever we had an opportunity to tap. So we recorded and uh, then we would turn the tape and then the CIA would amplify it a hundred times. And we never, of course, you're dealing with the CIA. We never hear anything back from them. It's always like they take, they take. And in my case, they never gave anything back. Um, so we don't know. But I like to think they had great intel off of our tapes. I'll take a little liberty with that 55 years later. <laughs> well, I... <clears throat> I, I kind of thought, um, you know, the training that we observed was was pretty significant, you know, because we, oh, yeah. we had heard about things like that. But all of a sudden, to be uh, laying there watching them, uh, that was uh, pretty cool. Um, seeing uh, female truck drivers in convoys, um, and when I reported that in from from uh, on site, they told us that I really didn't see female truck drivers. We took pictures of them. Uh, I requested to take a prisoner, to, you know, to capture one and, and bring her back. Uh, and they said, you know, under no circumstances were you going to try to take a prisoner from from the convoy. Um, when we got back, they you know took our film from the cameras, told us there were no women on the uh, the you know in the pictures that we took. Uh, all of that was debunked uh, years later when they finally uh, released information that said yes, a lot of the truck drivers on those convoys were women to save from having to put you know NVA or soldiers in there. Women were driving them. You know, but in 69, we were not going to, as a country, uh, admit that we were putting airstrikes on women every day. So they were not going to let that information out. So it was covered up. Um, so, you know, some things like that I thought was pretty significant at the time, but they, they told me we really didn't see that. <clears throat> yeah, also, Rob, as a footnote to that, uh, ST Oregon with George Sternberg had captured a POW. They were on the King Bee flying back. And as the King Bee took off, it, was at, it got to elevation around four to 5,000 feet. And they were inspecting the prisoner for weapons or hand grenades. And at some point, they found out that it was a woman. And they were so surprised when they opened up the fatigue jacket to see her breast that it was a woman. They all let go for a second. She turned around and ran out the door of the King Bee, jumping to her death rather than going back to be a POW. So those were hardcore communists. And uh, my favorite motto was, my favorite commie is a dead commie, be it man or woman. All right, well, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I, I just, when you get into that kind of war, I guess it's, you know, it's kind of all or nothing, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we have um, a, a guy in the audience, Globs of Metal. His grandfather was a chief of a PBR in TF-116 in, in the, the Riverine, uh, you know, and he was asking, did, did either of you ever get a chance to ride on a PBR, you, you know, the, the, same, the same boat that you see in Apocalypse Now going up the river? I didn't, but Lynn Black and his team 
with Tim Schaaf with the one zero with uh, ST Alabama. They were up on a training mission and they got stranded. And then the uh, NVA hit them at night on a training mission. And the NVA literally pushed the team down to the South China Sea. King bees couldn't fly. And there were no air assets available. And Lynn Black had the frequency for PRB, is it? And they were able to get a hold of the Navy. And the PRB came in and saved ST Alabama. They came in with their 50 calibers blazing. And uh, the team had to go out in the water. But that, that was one classic example of the Navy Lily saving uh, ST Alabama. This would be in the end of September or like October 1st or the 2nd of 1968. Okay, thank you. So I guess, uh, so here's a question from Trick, which is what was the most technologically advanced weapon you encountered while on a mission over the fence? Well, I always thought the car 15 was the most advanced. <laughs> We loved it, held it close, and uh, and I went through, I think, a total of four. They always worked when they had to work, and uh, I feel like I'm alive today thanks to the uh, the uh, engineering of the CAR-15. Of course, uh, Nick and I both had Thumper, which was a sold-off M79, So, but I don't know if I call that sophisticated weaponry or not. Dick probably has got a better story. <laughs> No, I I agree with you. The car car fifteen, but you know, I thought I had one, I uh, a a rocket pistol was was created. It shot a fifty caliber projectile that had a rocket engine in the back of it, um, and it was in like a little toy pop gun or something. You, <laughs> you squeezed a little handle, uh, it hit the Primer in the back of, of the projectile, and you got a whoosh. It kind of blew your hair back a little bit, and that thing was going down range. And after about 15 feet, it shoot through a four by four. It was unreal because it was a a steel uh, projectile. Um, but you hit somebody that's five feet away from you, it wouldn't hurt them. The problem was I tried to use it one time to take out a guard, and when I pulled the trigger, it just clicked. <laughs> you just made a loud click. So oh, no. um, our stealth was compromised at that point. So we had to go back to the trusty car 15 and um, deal with the guard that way. But uh, if if you look it up now, if, if you Google it, <clears throat> uh, and it ended up being called a gyro jet pistol. Right. And if you, if you go out on, on YouTube, you'll see videos of, of them being fired out there. Yeah, we had fun with them on the rings, but uh, we never took them out to the field like Dick did. And then I'm amazed that yours mi misfired them. God. Yeah. <laughs> did, did, didn't I, they have... I thought it was going to be pretty cool. Didn't, didn't they leave a white trail back leading back to you, the firer? I, if you shot it at, at night and, and there would be some smoke, you know, because it, it was a rocket, a little rocket engine. So you'd have a little smoke trail, you know, going out. So not ideal. No. No. <laughs> no. So um, this, this is a question from Whiplash. Um, what was the most uh, unique thing you were able to photograph on a mission? Um, again, I never saw the photos. We were told they were pretty good, but in Cambodia, when we ran a target, we had a perfect insertion by the Green Hornets from the Air Force 20th Special Operations Squadron. And it was that mission that I talked about earlier. Before we got pulled out of that mission, we had thick jungle that would go right up to the road. And then you could literally stick the camera out and take pictures of the NVA coming down the highway. And we had NVA trucks, convoys, um, no tanks. And then they had some troops that marched passes along the side. And we took pictures of it all. And we turned it in. And uh, so those are the best pictures, although I never saw them. Yeah, I thought the ones we took of the women truck drivers were pretty cool. That's oh. unique. <laughs> 
it. They just and we did see. The- yeah, at one point we there was another helicopter. We were waiting to be picked up uh, and extracted. And uh, I I called Covey and told him that um, he was going to have to take send our aircraft to a rendezvous point. We were still twenty minutes or so uh, from the extraction LZ. And he said, "Well, you know, the helicopters are about forty five minutes out." And I said, "No, you got it's about to land now." You know, so we had a discussion about that there are no other helicopters out there, <laughs> but one landed, and a group of NVA with with a tall guy uh, ran and got on it. We took pictures of it, but it was raining, uh, it was blurry, and we never saw it again. And we were told no, um, it it was it was something else. It wasn't Chinese. It wasn't, you know. Soviet or anything like that. So I think if, if we could have seen the pictures, I think um, we'd have been, you know, excited about what we had. Yeah. And also, as a footnote, Pat Watkins told us a story of, in the summer of '68, a similar situation where a recon team was up in the DMZ, and they made radio contact, and they said uh, it was time for the extraction. They had an appointed time, so for for this purpose, they the appointed hour would be at noon for the pickup, and they they were they got close to the LZ about 40 minutes early, and about 11:30 they heard a helicopter come in, and the RTO called back the base say, "Hey, the helicopter's here already." They said, "No, the King Bees are still en route," and so it was. This was a Russian helicopter, and how they just didn't bother to shoot it down, I'm not sure, but uh, very similar story. Cool, thank you. Um, it's all interesting, isn't it? What the, the stuff you come you, you can walk into over there. So, um, question about you, you know, your camouflage. Uh, so this is from the big man, which is which camo pattern did you use the most? Because uh, th- there's always an ongoing debate. You know, everyone has these base pictures wearing tiger stripe. And and we don't often see you guys dressed in your war gear in Tiger Stripe. So, hence the question, really. What 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 did you feel was the, the best uh, camo pattern, and what did you use the most? I don't know about Dick, but we never wore any camo uh, to the field for a mission. We always wore the standard jungle fatigues, additional pockets. The reason the material was stronger, it dried more quick, and the uh, uh, camouflage. Uh, clothing that was available at the time there were several different levels. Some were so thin that it tore too quickly. Others were too thick and it would just take a long, too long to dry. You could get crotch rot. So we stuck with the traditional uh, jungle fatigue. Now back at base camp we pose and look badass and everything but for the missions just regular conventional. Yeah, most of the pictures that I have of me um, at the base camp and tiger stripes um <laughs> yeah yeah they like tilt said they look they look cool um but i i wore the od jungle fatigues uh when i went out and when i came back to the states i was supposedly going back in eight months to sog so i had eight months um to train and enhance my skills and one, and I was an instructor with the ranger department. So one of the things that I did during that eight months is tested a lot of different camouflage patterns, uh, camouflage face patterns. Uh, and what I what I found was the most difficult fatigues to see were the the OD jungle fatigues. I mean, it it was harder to pick them out uh, than it was any of the other patterns. And particularly as it, it started to get dark, it was like you just disappeared if you had those on. It was so hard to see you. Did, did you did you spray them at all? No. You know, and I'm I'm sorry. Did you spray did them, you, Dick? What, where what? Did you spray did, your fatigue? Oh, Some guys no. would spray fatigues with black paint no i had um i sprayed 
some brown and black on a couple of canteen covers one time. Um, but no, I didn't. In TOG, I didn't use any. Cool. Thank you. But right. there'll be everyone changing their loadouts for the game now. You've said that. <laughs> so, um, and we're going to get demands, you know, to make the olive green. Well, I think we've done the olive green ones, actually. So, so that should be fine. Um, the pockets on the two extra pockets on the sleeves and two in yeah. between the pockets, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, so, um, so this is a good one. This is from Bird. Um, did your teams have a preference uh, for single or automatic fire, um, and why? Um, I think the preference would be dictated by what happened from the enemy. So, an in initial contact. Everybody preferred full automatic, gain fire superiority within that first five to ten seconds of the firefight. If you didn't gain it, you were dead. And then after that, once the fire, like in our case, Dick had the same thing where the combat goes on for an extended period of time for several hours. You have to go to, to single rounds and make every round count because you're going to run out of ammo at some point. And there's at least twice where... Uh, when our team got to the LZ on final extraction, I was down to my last magazine, last hand grenade, and last round for the M79. Twice. Then we had, I always carry 600 plus rounds. I think Dick may have carried more because he's just a show off. <laughs> I, I just carried 50 magazines, but um, <laughs> I just <clears throat> I like to shoot a lot. But yeah, I mean. <laughs> Initially, you know, you need to try to gain to fire superiority. But then uh, with with my guys, uh, we used to practice uh, in in different conditions. Sometimes the, the enemy might be 20 feet away from you, but you couldn't see him because of the vegetation. You could you could hear the uh, the weapon fire. Sometimes you could see the bushes move uh, from the blast from the weapon. Uh, in, in a lot of those cases, we'd fire two or three round bursts that where we heard the, uh, the weapon being fired, with having a little better chance of hitting them like that. Um, when we hit, hit uh, groups with napalm, and, you know, if, and they had napalm on them, they were walking torches or whatever, single rounds tended to work good for that. Um, there were a couple of times where they were on drugs, um, and I found a three round burst would put them down sometimes one or two rounds and they would continue to come at you. But if you hit them with a three round burst, it had so much knockdown power, it would just put them on down. So I, uh, and you'll see in the book, sometimes when we're in contact, you'll, you'll hear in the book where I'm telling people single shots, single shots or, or two round, two round or, or three depending on what I'm wanting them to, to do. Um, so we, and we used to practice that a lot uh, before we would go out on the mission. So they were, they were listening for some guidance. You know, even though we were training them, this is when you're gonna do what, uh, I would still try to reinforce it with verbal commands. Excellent, thank you guys. Um, and, and moving a bit closer quarters, uh, this is from Melon Mafia again. So was hand-to-hand -hand fighting important, and uh, did you study any martial arts? We had minimal martial arts going through special forces training. And then once and on, we picked up nunchucks and worked with them a little bit, but we never carried them to the field. Unfortunately, we never engaged, engaged in hand-to-hand -in -hand combat, uh, unlike some people. And I think Dick's got a couple of better stories than mine. <laughs> I yield the floor, Dick. <laughs> yeah, I had I had done martial arts, you know, training when I was in college and before I came, and um, but I found uh, the most effective thing in the hand-to-hand -hand, uh, encounters that I occasionally had was a was a K bar, you know, a, a good K bar, you know, will end things fairly quickly. Oh, uh, yeah, and there's some stories. Uh, about having to do that in, uh, in the book. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and on the same subject of weapons, did Sog ever use shotguns or machetes much? Um, some teams like uh, Les Daniels from uh, ST Rhode Island, he was a uh, part Indian, and Les carried a sawed off shotgun on his right thigh along with his car 15. And uh, a few other men carried shotguns, and I, I forget them by name. Uh, we thought about it, but uh, we did not carry the sawed off shotgun because we had the, the uh, M79, and we always had a couple of the um, all bearings in the uh, so the first round that we carried would be that round which was shrapnel essentially a double odd or triple odd buck and uh, so if like if we were changing magazines or something had gone wrong and they charged us that would be the first round that we would fire so we always carried a few of those canister rounds and then we of course the majority of the rounds we carried were HE, high explosive, 40M79. Yeah, we, I, I never had a team carry a shotgun, but we did have, you know, the sawed off uh, M79s and we had the buckshot rounds in there uh, that we could use. But, um, you know, I, I just never, never carried a shotgun because it, to me, it seemed like it's over too quick. You, you fire four or five rounds and, and you're, now you've got an empty weapon and you're not going to sit there and start loading a shotgun because you'll be dead before you can finish doing it, or at least that was my thought. Um, I like the car 15 because I could, yeah, I could put a lot of rounds down range in a short period of time. I subject, agree. On the subject of machetes, I imagine you probably wouldn't carry them on recon ops because you don't want to disturb the foliage. I had a, um, um, a survival axe I carried, and I only ever used it in combat just for clearing brush, trying to knock down the thin bamboo to try to clear an LZ, or uh, a few times we were just in thick vegetation trying to move. And I liked it because it had a blade on the back so you could cut through, and when you pull back, the blade could also cut as you pulled it back. Yeah, and, and, you know, that axe that Till's talking about was, I mean, that was a powerful weapon uh, as well as a as a tool. Um, I carried the, the K-Bar um, as kind of an in-between. So you had something you could fight with, but with the 7-inch blade on the K-Bar, you could chop bamboo, you could cut through a lot of vegetation and stuff with it. You know, and it was still small enough to use as a, a weapon, and it was light. Hey, perfect. Thank you. Um, I think Tilt's gone for his axe. <laughs> yeah, that's a powerful tool. I just happen to have mine right here. I never leave home without it. So that's a pouch. You yeah. pull back, or you cut through them. You pull back. You can also cut through some vines with it. That's my Frank and Warren survival axe, type two. Brilliant. Th thank you, Till. Yeah, we actually modeled that in the game, so you can actually you can kill an oh, really? NDA with one. Oh yeah, you can you can use it as a melee weapon in the game. Um, it's got a little more length than your K bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, I was looking, I was looking for the K bar in the game the other day, um, to use it, to have it as uh, one of my weapons. But I don't know. I didn't see it for some reason. We we can set you up with that. There's a you you ha you need a little code to to activate the melee weapons. So uh, we'll, okay. we'll get to you. Okay. Yeah, we'll come back to you on that one and get. So you've got it, we call it I think the Mark IV knife because I think K bar is a trademark. So. We, we couldn't use no. a trademark in the game, but that's what it's okay. called, I think. Okay, right. Mark IV knife, so it's definitely in the game, and you can have one, so. Um, 
and we've got your claymores and all the other bits you're going to need. So, and and tilts claymore with the Willy Pete on the front. <laughs> it's been added with the 1.3 update. So, yeah. Um, okay. Well, thanks for that. And um, let's have a look. What's the next question we've got here? So, um, can, time. Yeah, we go, we go for about another 20 minutes, I guess. So, uh, so Decker asked, was there? Was there a weapon or a bit of kit you couldn't get your hands on that you wanted? Never had that problem. Anything we wanted, we got it. Yeah, I. You know, I I I got everything I asked for. So, I carried the the twenty two with the integrated silencer with me most of the time. Occasionally, I would. Um, also carry a, a you know a, a 45 caliber pistol with me um so sometimes things got a little crowded with you know having the <laughs> sawed off 40 you know m79 on there and then having a 45 and a 22 and then somewhere i've got to have the you know car 15 but um but they're all good weapons and they all work how much did you weigh back then dick <laughs> I, I was uh, 140 pounds. <laughs> Soaking wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Soaking wet. I, I just about doubled my weight when I put all the, the gear on. You know, because I, I carried a radio too, so. And, and the battery for it. And the batteries, yeah. Young muscle stronger than old muscle. <laughs> I, I couldn't carry that now. <laughs> well, having having tried it on, because I because I went to Military Odyssey last year with uh, as you guys, you know, you dialed in on Zoom to talk to the guys, you know, who helped us with the with the game, and I put all the kit on, you know, for the RPD gunner, with all with actual cartridges and everything, and all the belts and all the pouches, and and uh, and there's a picture of me wearing it, you know, and my face is just a picture of pain um because it, it's like putting a piano on your back <laughs> you know, the, the lbe the lbe and the weapon are heavy enough but once you put the rook on the top it's like a couple of iron bars here on your um pressing down on your collarbone so once i put all that on i realized in our game we need to move a lot more slowly because you can't run in this but you might guess, run for a little while but not too long I was going to say, how do you, yeah. how, how do you do it? Yeah. I guess is it adrenaline? Yeah, you had a lot of a, adrenaline. I mean, if you were running, but if you were running, it was also getting lighter because you were shooting. <laughs> so, right? As you start to use the ammunition, it gets a lot lighter. But, but before then, I mean, you know, for the most part, where Tilt and I were running operations, you know the the vegetation was thick, um, you know, double, triple canopy, and we were moving very slowly anyway. Um, but once you get your shoulders toughened up enough so that it's not actually cutting into you and, you know, creating sores on your shoulders, uh, that helps out. And then you get your legs strong enough that you can, you know, go uphill carrying all that, but you're moving slow unless they start to shoot at you and then you get that immediate adrenaline rush that uh, gives you a lot more strength and then you start using up the ammunition and the weight starts to go down got you okay um so we've got a question from jared 96 so other than covey what were the other air call signs that you would have used uh, he, i think he means in fixed wing so i mean we know we know about your the ac130s overhead um what but were there any that we wouldn't immediately think of that that you had fixed wing working on any missions with you well we always had hillsborough in the daytime and moonbeam at night those were the airborne command centers that were airborne 24 hours a day. But you could not always make contact with them. It would depend if they were within range or not. And then uh, 
we always carried the ERC-10, which had an emergency beeper on it that sent out a, um, a signal that could be picked up. So there was a few times when we could not make contact with the uh, PRC-25, so we hit the emergency uh, beeper on the ERC-10, and a few times we made contact with uh, different Air Force. One was an F-4 who put us in contact, then he called Covey and said he made contact with us, and Covey finally came out. Another time um, in 70, we hit the, uh, the beeper and we contacted a Raven. And the Ravens, of course, did more work with the CIA further northwest into the AO of Laos. They came out. It was the first time we saw OV-10s. And his OV-10 had 2.75 uh, rockets on it. And we weren't used to having a Covey. They never, they never carried ordnance other than smoke uh, rockets, you know, for markers. And uh, so the Air Force, anything in the air, if they heard the frequencies, you never knew who would pick it up. But it was, you know, it helped. And we always happy to talk to somebody, then they could do the radio relay. And we, we talked to aircraft uh, some, you know, the Army in particular, the helicopters or gunships. Um, and sometimes you had a lot of those you were working. I used to, um, I used my my left hand and my right thigh as my information center. So I was writing call signs, you know, on, on my hand or on my thigh, uh, just to help me not get mixed up with who I was talking to at the time. And they, because they would rotate sometimes, they'd go back to rearm, refuel, come back out, or you might get you, marine aircraft, and then you, then you've got army aircraft coming in. You got the king bees, so sometimes you know Covey um, would turn some of them over to you and let you talk uh, directly to them. Um, the Air Force aircraft you had the problem with, unless you were. Um, using your survival radio, I mean, it would talk on, on the guard frequency, but, um, but you know, Covey's, one of Covey's big jobs was managing all the air assets that he was bringing in to um, help you get out. Okay, thank, thank you, guys. Um, we're, we're kind of moving towards the end section, so, so it's sort of a bit more reflective, I guess. Uh, Gotta Gibby has asked a question, which is, have either of you noticed a change in public perception towards Vietnam vets? Um, and if, you, if so, how do you feel about that change and, and why do you think it occurred? Um, yeah, there's been a perceivable change. I think even when uh, I came home in 1970, once you got out of the city and once you got away from the uh, pacifists and the hippies, most Americans supported us and treated us with respect, the real Americans, not the fringe left element. And uh, uh, yes, we now get definitely get treated uh, better today. And the... Uh, um, any respect, any, most of the Americans that I've run into the last 20 years, they all said the same thing. It's like, what happened when you all came home wasn't fair and uh, it wasn't right. But the benefit was that what happened to us, our country learned, and every war since, our country supports all veterans, regardless of the politics of the war. I think that's been a benefit from it. Yeah, I, you know, once I left the military, went into the civilian world, corporate world, I, I didn't mention having been in the military before. Um, people had such a, <clears throat> even if they were supporting the military, they had such a, <clears throat> excuse me, strong um, stereotype of what military people were like, military leaders are like. Um, that I found it was better just not to mention it uh, until 9-11. And once 9-11 happened, uh, ever, I mean, it was amazing how the attitude changed uh, toward 
you know, Vietnam vets or any any vet. Um, and then if I mentioned it, you know, I got a lot of questions. People wanted to know, appreciate my service, things like that. So 9-11 made a, a big change, you know, from my perception of the people I was encountering. I agree 100%. Okay, thank you guys. Um, and Kurt asked, what, what did you think of John Wayne's movie, The Green Berets, back in the day? <laughs> well, I, I essentially liked it. I mean, when we looked at it, we all made fun of it, you know, because um, you could tell that the helicopters were actually flying in Fort Benning area, Georgia somewhere, where they did a lot of the filming. But, you know, initially he wanted to make a documentary on Special Forces, but the regular army, because they hated the Green Berets at that time, they wouldn't allow. So John Wayne said, well, screw you. I'm going to make a movie anyway, and he did. And uh, there are parts of, particularly the parts about working with the, the indigenous people, and uh, I thought that was right on. And some of the training, and uh, you know, the, Duke, the Duke did the best he could. I mean, in my case, after we got done our in-country training, we got to Vietnam, in-country training. They showed the movie, The Green Berets, and then a couple of days later, the training ended. That's when we had our, at the end, a little guy comes out and says, hey, we're looking for volunteers. Johnny McIntyre goes, for why? I said, can't, can't say, whether you're in or you're out. And, of course, that's volunteering for SOG. So Duke would have done it, so we, we had to go right, go right with the flow. <laughs> that was May of 68. Yeah, there were there were two things that happened, you know, pretty close here, uh, the movie and the song, uh, and it it gave instant recognition to uh, the Green Beret, and I found going through um, the airport in Atlanta and out in California, you know, I had my uniform on, people just parted as I walked through. No one was going to bump into me. Everyone got out of my way. There were people, <laughs> there were people who, uh, you know, the, the hippies and, and protesters and whatever, but they shouted their insults from a long ways off. Uh, <laughs> most, most of them didn't realize I could have closed that distance before they could have started moving. Um, <laughs> I could have. I could have been on them had I wanted to, but they were jailed, and then they get away quickly. Um, and I, I thought that was that was kind of funny. I, I kept a straight face. I was trying to, you know, look like a green beret going through there, but it, it was interesting. They had heard about, you know, the beret, and uh, and and coming back was the same way. People got out of my way coming through the airport. Same, same. So, did did either of you ever watch the TV series Tour of Duty? No. I don't think so. I think it was the end of the 80s, and the, and the third season, uh, they actually go into SOG, so it's, it's something that's maybe worth a look at some point. Okay, um, and, okay, this is a question from Waffles. What were your thoughts when you first heard your ex or or you know, heard that your experiences would be put into a, into a, a video game? I thought it was cool. I mean, really cool to think that um, first of all, that somebody was even interested enough in SOG to do it. B, that somebody had the resources to get it done, and had the talent to do it, as you all at Arma have proved to be able to do. And third, it was just a real honor to have. Uh, anybody por portray our stories uh, in any video or any uh, media, whether it's video, interviews, podcasts, and with respect and, and the effort to pay homage to SOG. And that was just outstanding. And uh, that's why I've been honored to be a part of that for over three years now. Well, I was... <clears throat> I was excited about it, but but I have to admit that I learned about it from the best salesman you have. <laughs> so some some guy, you know, um, 
John John Stryker, Meyer, something like that. A.K. Knucklehead was telling me all about <laughs> it and got me all fired up about it. So yeah, I was I was pretty excited. <laughs> Cool. It's a slightly loaded question, but it didn't come from me. You know, it came it came from the audience. So you know, um, we understand. And uh, and Decker asked, uh, "How much of the of the game have you played or seen, and did you enjoy it?" I've only seen a little bit of the game because um, with uh, four children, podcasts, and five acres to take care of here in Tennessee, I'm sorry to say that I don't have more time to dedicate to games right now. I want to get my fourth book going. I'm trying to catch up to Dick here. I, I want to stay ahead of him if I can. And uh, so I haven't. But the few times that you all invited me in to see the game and that I've gone in and checked it out, it's just amazing. And like you mentioned earlier, the fact that the guys are running more in the videos and now you're even adjusting that because of the weight factors. So the games are, the details are just phenomenal. Dick actually plays a game, so I think his answer would be more profound than mine. I was impressed from the time I saw it. You know, we had a discussion, you know, with with you, Rob, and some of the other guys. Um, yeah, it ran my heart right up. You know, <laughs> by the time I got by the time I got on the chopper to to go out for the insertion, my heart rate was already up. So. Uh, you know, from the realism, from everything looked right. It looked good. All the equipment, uh, the things that that we we were doing. So uh, it's an it's very impressive. You know what you guys have done with it, and then you know all the little um, mechanisms and yeah, yeah. And al algorithms and things that that are in there. How um, it's adjusting your fatigue level based on you know, the, the amount of energy you're exerting, how much weight you're carrying, whether you're running like Tilt was saying or not, all these different things uh, that are being calculated, uh, you know, how your weight's dropping based on the ammunition you're firing and all. I mean, it's just um, amazing what all the game is doing. And then uh, giving the NVA, the, the AI capability to learn and and come after you so that's pretty good yeah and even the cockpit of your ue i mean that was the thing that blew me away because i i've flown in the co-pilot seat a few times just wanted to be a helicopter pilot someday i've got a little training in country on these uh milk runs you know and uh that, i mean that detail was just amazing hats off to your artists and the people that pulled that all together Oh, thank you so much. And and uh, I'm looking forward to, because we're training uh, Dick at the moment uh, in, in in our own recon company to get, get him into game and run ops with uh, with Ken and, and Don, who, who are already ahead of you uh, on point. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity that you guys have given me to, to do that and the, the training that um, <laughs> you're, you're still... <laughs> Providing me, I mean, I can, I can walk up to a tree now and actually get, you know, manage to go around it. I don't, I don't get stuck when I run into a tree. Uh, <laughs> I can, I can move around it now. So I'm, uh, I'm getting pretty good. I, I can get on the ground. I can crawl, and you know, shooting's not an issue. It's just, you know, some of the movement. Um, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a steep learning curve um, to make those movements um, become kind of you know natural, so that with your fingers on the keyboard that you you think you know move or duck or lean or reload, you know, and you just hit the right key without having to look down. That's that's the the training that's needed for you know, and everyone in this room has basically had to go through that learning the game. So. Uh, I, I noticed we've got Ken Bore in the audience. He he just said, "Well done to Tilt Dick and Rob." So he's he's there. He's 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 come in in a clandestine disguise Ooh. as Apple <laughs> <I> Pie. <think laughs> so because he's away this weekend, so he's he's come in as somebody else. Um, hi, Ken. Um, clandestine and, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and and I mean, he picked the game up real fast, and uh, we go out with him every Sunday, um, and the guys also go out. I don't do it, but they go out every Thursday as well. He's 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 out there all the time, and he's he's uh, um, you know, and obviously from his history and in all of his experience, he's an amazing war leader. So to go out and run a mission with 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 Ken in the team, everybody loves it. It's you know the the experience that we're learning. Uh, it changes the way we live our lives. It's not just playing a game to us. You know we we pick up as men. We pick up lessons. You know working with you warriors. So it's pretty fantastic that we can do this. Um, right. There's a there's a final question from Decker, um, which is, if and when the Savage team gets the chance to make a new SOG game, what's the first thing you would want to see added? to better reflect your stories and realities? I'll yield to, uh, to Dick on this one. Uh, I want more stress in it. I mean, uh, I want you to feel the stress and it have an, Im an impact, not just a weight, not just getting tired, um, but actually feeling more stress when you go on a SOG mission, you know, very high likelihood you're going to die or when you did it then, um, not just, you know, get hit and be able to respawn and come back, but um, having some factors put in there that runs your stress level up, you know, we don't, we don't have to have someone necessarily die during the game although that would run the stress level up for the ones who uh, didn't die. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think there's some really cool things. And I know, you know, there's some, some constraints in terms of what you can do. Uh, and, and since it's a game and you want people to like it and play it and keep coming back. Um, but, yeah, I think some of the things we've talked about already is to be able to put in there uh is a lot of that still possible and you're just going to take it to an even higher level than you have now and you got guys like like uh tilt and uh general bow ray and those guys who uh, have a lot of knowledge that they can share so i'm looking forward to to what you do with it because there's any way to enhance and to convey the stress but once you're on the ground and your adrenaline flows and uh, even if you've been on the ground for a while, I mean, it may ebb a little, but there's always that extra tension because you're behind enemy lines and the uh, game is on. And we don't know what they've got. They had great RDF. And, of course, we were more compromised than we realized at the time. And the, the epitome of that was Dick on patrol they come up on secure radio playing the funeral dirge with the names of his entire team. Yeah, I, I yeah. mean, I'd love to put things like that in the game. You know, that all these small but very memorable weird moments, you know, just to bring the real stories alive, I think would be really cool. Yeah, you always have little things like touching your boot. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how we'd feel that in the in the game. Sitting I know. In the <laughs> hey, your creative guys could probably figure this one out. You got to turn it over to them. Just turn them loose. <laughs> we'd have to smell some sort of uh, rubber hand you put under your desk, and it taps you on the on the foot. <laughs> um, there are a lot of things there, but haptic, you know, haptic is out there in a lot of different ways now that you you know you wire the keyboard, you do do things. Where you you feel somebody touch your leg or touch your boot while you're uh, sitting there in the RON, or have somebody um, like book book two uh, when when you have somebody walk inside your perimeter and coming directly at you about to step on you, uh, you can feel that you feel it with your heart, you feel it with everything, so. I'm sure we can wire that in, into the keyboard or the headset or something. You certainly feel it enough in, in the game. Um, and 
when you get if you run through the campaign and you get to the Oscar eight mission at the end, um, whenever we say, OK, guys, it's Oscar eight tonight, there's just this collective groan. Because everyone's like, oh, you know, we're going to have to really because <laughs> you've got to dig deep to get through that mission and, and get on the extract. It's 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 not easy. Um, you know, and if you weren't a tight knit team, you're going to be screaming and yelling and getting into a rage. It's it's a, a very frustrating, you know, visceral experience. I think I think we kind of, you know, blowing our own trumpet. I think we nailed it with that one. We made a very hard mission that reflects. You know, we I based it on October fifth. You know, uh, Lynn Black. And um, yeah, you feel it. I mean, you definitely feel it. And you're going to have a chance to have a go at that dick once you're once you've got past yeah. running trees and stuff it, you know we'll, we'll build you up slowly but uh once you get into that you'll be able to see how just how stressful it can get so i get to get my fourth book done I'll, I'll maybe i'll hope to have time then and come back and uh, mm -hmm. learn how to learn how to work with the professors like dick and ken cool well we've got a seat for you on the chopper <laughs> great okay um any any final comments before I do the wrap up? No, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, hats off to Sam. Our prayers will be with him for that journey, that effort, and uh, to salute what he's doing. And uh, happy to participate and um, look, for, look for, uh, forward to uh, future sessions like this with uh, anybody that's, that's taken time to play the game and support the effort. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate and uh, uh, looking forward to following Sam. So hopefully we've, we've got a way set up that um, we we know where he is and what he's doing and can kind of track the progress along and, uh, you know, be pushing and supporting him the whole way. Amen on that. And, um, and thank you, guys. So. I just say it's really cool to be able to tell everyone here that, you know, this, the party isn't over and that, um, you know, Dick has now officially uh, joined the advisor team alongside Ken, uh, while <laughs> Carrot and Tilt. Um, and we've got Barry Pensek, the Cobra pilot from Tailwind and Don Hassey joining us, um, or well, continuing with us, um, on the next game and, and so on. Um, we're planning a bunch of new projects together, which you'll you'll hear more about in the coming months now that we've finished our 1.3 update. Um, and that does include uh, graphic novels, uh, the new game we're going to start designing, uh, documentaries, and, and hopefully even a TV show. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, and, uh, which we're all talking about behind the scenes. Um, and we we're all just so excited that we could start with a, a DLC for Armour 3 and just see where we can take it with these guys. So um, um, please do watch the Sam Cox podcast if you haven't seen it, if you haven't watched it already. Um, you, you know, and um, by donating today uh, for his expedition, you'll stand a chance to win some of the personal, personalized raffle prizes uh, donated by Dick and Tilt. Um, and uh, and some of the other SOG advisors. Um, does include some rare um, personal challenge coins and signed copies of books, including Dick's book, which is hot off the press, or at least will be by the time you get your prize, hopefully. Um, and also, if there's any budding artists out there, just to, just a reminder that uh, the artwork competition also offers these personalized SOG prizes, so, so make sure you, uh, you get your entries in. So uh, thank you, gents, with all our hearts for supporting Sam on his journey and for being here with us tonight.